the meeting of the governing body. Uh, we'll begin uh, as normal with the affirmation. Uh, tēnā tato katoa, we seek wisdom, understanding, insights into the views and circumstances of others, strength to seek what we believe in, humility to accept the combined decisions of others, patience, good humour at all times, tolerance and courtesy while working in the best interests of our community. So uh, if I can now ask uh, Sandra to do a roll call, please. Morena, members. Uh, Deputy Mayor Cashmore. Kia ora. Uh, Councillor Bartley. Kia ora. Kia ora. Councillor Casey. Morena, Sandra. And uh, Councillor Collins. Councillor Combe. Atamari, kia ora. Kia ora. Councillor Cooper. Morena. Councillor Dalton. Morena, Sandra. Morena. Councillor Darby. Morena. Morena. Councillor Filipaina. Tarofa and Morena, Sandra. Morena. Councillor Fletcher. Oh, we have an apology for lateness for Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Henderson. Kia ora. Kia ora. Councillor Hills. Kia ora, Koto Kato. Kia ora. Councillor Mulholland. Councillor Sayers. Yes, thank you. Present. Councillor Simpson. Morena. Good morning, everybody. Councillor Stewart. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Walker. Councillor Watson. Hello. And Councillor Young. Here are Taja Dao. All right. Can we just check Councillor Collins again? Yeah, sorry, Sandra. I am on uh, online now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Morning. I'm Councilor online Malcolm. too. Apologies, Councillor Mulholland. Okay. And just once more for Councillor Walker. Thank you. Back to you, Mayor Phil. Um, thank, thank you very much, Sandra. Um, just before we uh, get into our uh, our formal agenda, um, I'd like to <coughs> acknowledge a milestone that has been achieved by um, by Sandra uh, O'Toole uh, in marking 30 years of service to to local government uh, in Auckland, uh, which is a pretty remarkable achievement. Uh, Sandra started out at the Devonport Borough Council, as it was then. Uh, she then transitioned to the North Shore City Council. And of course, the peak of her career is, uh, she's just come into the room now, uh, has uh, been um, the uh, 11 years or more that she spent uh, with, with the, Auck the new Auckland Council. Um, it's an interesting period of time, 30 years. Uh, Duncan Glasgow noted in a card that he um, sent to Sandra that he was just five years old when uh, when she started at council. And then he obviously thought that this might be misunderstood as being ageist and uh, acknowledged that she must have been a child herself when she uh, started at council all those years ago. Um, Sandra, it's not just the length of time that you've uh, been with council, but it's it's really the quality of the, the contribution that you've made to us uh, that we're hugely grateful for. Um, it's not an easy task being the team leader for governance advisors and also being responsible uh, for our proceedings at the at the governing body. And I just want to acknowledge, Sandra, what a huge help that you've been during my time as mayor. Um, on the governing body committee, uh, your knowledge of standing orders. Um, but what I think is really special about Sandra is her unique ability uh, to combine being helpful and patient with being assertive when it's necessary for her to be assertive in order to keep us on track. And Sandra, you've done that incredibly well. So thank you very much for that. Uh, you have kept us on track and you have ensured that this committee has operated smoothly. Um, so from all of us, um, you know, remotely, the hands waving there on the screen, um, a big thank you. Uh, for your massive contribution. Yay. Uh, and uh, a big encouragement um, 
not to think that you're nearing the end of your term. I know that you'll be tempted to be a full-time grandmother, but we really appreciate the work that you've done and we look forward to uh, further years of uh, your contribution uh, to our committee and to our council. So big thank you everybody for Sandra O'Toole. You can have a right of reply if you choose. <laughs> she's, she's declined the right of reply. Um, so speech, great. Speech. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Sandra's, yeah, I don't know whether that came across on air, but she said she might say something that we, we don't want to hear. So uh, anyway, um, let's get down to the normal business of our, our committee now. Um, I have apologies from Councillor Daniel Newman uh, away on honeymoon and uh, soon, I think, uh, from Councillor Shane Henderson. Are you going to be leaving us soon, Shane, for the same purpose? Yes, a week more and then I'll head off. I'll do the planning committee and then go yeah. after that. It's, uh, I blame water care. There's something in the water supply in Auckland uh, that these things should be happening all at once. Um, we have an apology for lateness from Councillor Chris Fletcher and a potential apology that I hope won't be necessary from myself if we go beyond 1.30. Um, I'm going to hand over to the Deputy Mayor. Um, I've got a speaking engagement with Rally New Zealand and you guys are the first to know that Rally New Zealand, for the first time in 10 years, this September will be coming back to Auckland as part of the international series. And it's great to see those international events now coming back to Auckland for Aucklanders to enjoy and to give a boost to our, our hospitality and accommodation industry. So um, I'll move and uh, the Deputy Mayor, uh, Bill Cashmore, will second. Just checking that I don't assume that without uh, just... Aye. 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 Uh, that we accept those apologies, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no, I declare that carried. Um, as normal, just to ask if there are any declarations of interest, there, there will be this time because of uh, the liquor-related item on the agenda. Yes, Mr Chair, um, Councillor Cooper, um, for the public input and yeah, item 6 and item 10, and if somebody I will leave um, at the beginning of public input uh, for that, and if someone would just... Um, let me know when that's finished. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, are there, uh, Councillor Shane Henderson? Yes, uh, same again, same as uh, Councillor Cooper. Thanks, Matt. And normally we would have Councillor Newman, but he's absent. So um, thank you for those declarations and uh, uh, the two councillors will be absent for the period of discussion uh, on related to the Sale of Liquor Act. Um, we have the confirmation of minutes of the 24th of February. So uh, the motion is to confirm the ordinary minutes of that meeting, uh, including the confidential. Uh, that's who's... Simpson? Uh, oh. Simpson? Oh, yeah, get Councillor Desley Simpson, thank you. Have I got a seconder for that, please? Yeah, I'll second, Cathy. Councillor Cathy Casey is seconded. Uh, any discussion arising out of the minutes? If not, I will put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 And to the contrary, no, I declare that carried. Uh, we now come to item five, which is petitions. Uh, and we have a, a petition uh, that's in the name of Jessie Stanley, and I can see Jessie on the screen here, from Save Our Sands. She is accompanied by, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Jessie, uh, Olivia Haddon, also from the same organisation, Natalie Jessup from Endangered Species Foundation, and Elliot Pryor from Greenpeace. And there is a secondary petition that is attached to the original, um, but can be uh, accessed online. Um, before I uh, invite Jessie to speak to us, um, I need to note that there are currently three live resource consent applications going through the hearing process. And as these processes are quasi-judicial, um, the advice that I have from our legal counsel is that it's not, while it, it is appropriate to hear the petition, it will not be appropriate for us to question the petitioners, nor uh, to in any way involve ourselves in the debate. Uh, the motion from this petition will be as normal uh, to, to thank the petitioners, uh, to accept the petition, uh, but the other aspect of how we deal with this petition will be as part of the petition that we forward that to the reporting planner uh, so that it can be included in the appendix to the section 42a report to the hearings panel 
Uh, now, that um, 42A report is, is how our planners put advice in front of those who will be making the decision, which are the, uh, the, the, the hearing panel. So um, noting those points, um, it's my pleasure to, to, to welcome Jessie and her team. And uh, Jessie, norm, the normal time is, is five minutes uh, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you so much for having me this morning. My name is Jessie Stanley. I will flip to my presentation and then we'll make a start. So it hasn't come up yet. My screen. It's, uh, it's the gremlins. Oh, okay. Only meeting and organisers can present. I'll present with no images. I can forward you the presentation. Hang on. No, I think, um, Sandra, oh. you'll be able to help. Okay. Sandra from our end will be able to put the Thank presentation you. up. I've, I've seen a copy of the presentation, so we'll have all those um, uh, photos and smiling faces. Uh, <laughs> Thank uh, you. Um, the, slides, uh, the slides can just go at 15 second intervals if you like. Okay, we're still, um, it's not coming up on my screen, Sandra. So is anybody else seeing these slides? No. No. This doesn't come out of your time, Jesse. Oh. so <laughs> <laughs> it's not a plot. Um, okay, but look, why don't you start and then cool. we'll get yeah, the slides up and here. we'll flick through those uh, oh as, as you go along. Oh, here we go. Um, Great, yeah. here we go. We've got it up. I am from a community group called Save Our Sands, who are very concerned about sand mining at the Pākari Mangawhai Embayment. Uh, we're here today to ask you to decline all future sand mining applications, to stop all present sand mining, and to prohibit this in the CMA. We represent the voice of thousands from the community and present to you our petition with well over 14,000 signatures. This embayment has been continuously mined for over 100 years, and as a consequence of this, the beach and ecosystem is very sick. Sand mining is literally sucking the life from this area. We see rapid erosion, the obliteration of shellfish beds, which in turn impact the whole food chain, destruction of surf banks, increased rips and holes at the beaches, and also it's the home of many critically endangered species. Sand mining is also threatening the Mangafai sand spit, which protects the whole community and the houses in Mangafai. Currently, the mining company, McCallum Brothers, are requesting three new consents that, if granted, will see another 9 million cubic metres of sand taken over the next 35 years. Now, to imagine what this looks like, take a one metre cubed container of sand, and if you place them end to end, it'll give you the length of New Zealand. Not once, but six times. The sand from this embayment is non-replenishing, created millions of years ago. It's a finite resource, and it's a race against time for our community. The mining companies have new technology now, which allows them to take away three times the amount of sand than, than they used to. Simply put, we have reached the tipping point, and now we see the beaches being sucked away in front of our very eyes. And there are alternatives. Research at the, of the Kaipara Harbour has identified that sand available in their region is equal quality to Parkery sand. It is already regularly supplied to the Auckland construction market, is commercially viable, and volumes are already consented to meet any market demands. And unlike Parkery sand, it's, from a, it's a sustainable open source of sand. Better still, there is technology that exists for alternatives. For example, manufactured sand. Japan stopped seafloor sand mining over 20 years ago. They, re, they use manufactured sand. And this type of thing is booming in China and Australia. And it's also commercially viable. The reliance on sand for construction is a global issue. Sand, which takes millions of years to create, is being devoured at such speed that beaches all over the globe are simply disappearing. We need to innovate and invest in lower carbon construction practices, and you, the Council, have the power to put in legislation to facilitate this. The last consent granted to the miners was overseen by the Environment Court in 2004, in which a strict set of criteria was to be adhered to. This was implemented to ensure that no destruction of the seafloor was to occur. And to keep an eye on this, regular scientific surveys and auditing, auditing was supposed to happen. This did not happen. The management of this consent by the Council Coastal Process Team was woeful. My community had to conduct a small independent seabird survey themselves to alert the Council of the destruction that is taking place. 
the recent RMA hearing was halted because of our evidence, and when they required that a large seafloor survey be conducted, the results were even worse than we thought. It describes the seafloor as looking like a ploughed field. Council staff continue to deny their accountability for the management of this consent. Their feedback to us is that they were not responsible for monitoring this and that it was the responsibility of the miners, McCullum brothers. So the consent has been run like an honesty box system. Why does Auckland Council continue to allow such poor self-regulation by industry with no auditing of volumes of sand taken and to turn a blind eye to the many breaches of the consent that have happened on and off the water? Our community is facing a David versus Goliath battle. This is a billion dollar contract and our community has been let down. The governance of this mining consent has been absent. Mining industry self-regulation is unacceptable. New Zealand government committed to put 30% of New Zealand waters under marine protection by 2030. The threats from climate change make this impetus to that even greater. We need Auckland Council to step up so that our community isn't forced into continuously trying to protect um, the public natural resources to ensure that the most basic environmental protections are applied. We are asking you today to better recognise the rights and interests of Tangata Whenua, Mana Moana and the Pākari CMA and hear the voices of many thousands of Auckland taxpayers, all who want sand mining urgently to be stopped in this area. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Jessie, and for the reasons uh, that I expressed before, we, we, we won't have questions as we would normally have, um, but uh, we appreciate um, your presentation, the information that you've provided to us, and uh, the petition will be provided to the decision makers on the consent, which will be the, the hearing panel. Um, I think uh, Councillor Pippa Coombe um, has agreed yeah. to um, uh, uh, move the motion that I foreshadowed before, and I think she's also going to physically accept the uh, uh, the the printed uh, p petition off you. Uh, do I have a seconder for the uh, uh, councillor Sayers? Uh, your worship, Coun councillor Sayers seconded. So I, I will put that motion, which is to thank the petitioners, to accept the petition, and then to forward the petition to the reporting planner uh, to be made available to the, the hearing panel. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. I declare that carried. And once again, uh, thank you, Jesse, and, and your team for being with us this morning. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Take, take care. Uh, mate wa. Um, right, we come now to item five. Uh, and I think uh, Sandra advises me that we have a record number of applications for public input. Um, and the, um, the first item for public input uh, is uh, a request from the Screen Industry uh, Sites of Significance Working Group. Um, but on advice, I've declined that understanding order 7.7.4a. Uh, on the basis that this is a matter that has already been uh, considered and decided. The other seven requests all relate to uh, the notice of motion from Councillor Bartley that's before us today. Um, all seven uh, public inputs are in support of the notice of motion. Uh, two aren't able to be with us and uh, I'll have a motion to, uh, in due course, to um, to table uh, the submission that we have from one of those two um, uh, submitters. Uh, there are four uh, petitioners who will, uh, thankfully, um, from the point of view of making this a more coherent process, uh, present jointly. Um, those are the Counties Monaco District Health Board, uh, Louisa uh, Sailailai, uh, Alcohol Health Watch, Dr. Nikki Jackson, Auckland Regional Public Health Service, Dr. Nick Eichler, and the Salvation Army, Anna Ika. So they will present um, a single presentation encapsulating uh, their shared views, and then we'll have questions. And then the, um, the final um, public input will be from Chloe Swarbrick, MP, uh, who is the, um, the sponsor of the legislation uh, before Parliament uh, or to be drawn uh, from the, the members' ballot 
to go into Parliament in due course, uh, which our notice of motion is in support of. So we'll take Chloe separately and questions to Chloe separately. But can I now welcome our our, our four um, joint uh, uh, submitters uh, for their presentation, and I'm not quite sure um, who's leading that off. So I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves, and uh, then we look forward to hearing your petition. Uh, I think uh, uh, petition submission. Um, uh, I think that will take just over ten minutes, and then we'll have a period of time for questions. So over to the submitters, please. Good morning, uh, Mayor and, and councillors. I'm just waiting for my colleagues to, uh, so I can see that they're present. I'm here, Louise is here. Mm. Yeah, Hello, yeah, Nick. Yeah. Great, mm. Nick, would you like to commence? Sure thing. Tēnā uh, koutou katoa, um, Nick Ashla um, I'm the one of the medical officers of health uh, for the Auckland region at Auckland Regional Public Health Service. Uh, you may have heard of us recently from our work in COVID-19, um, but we, um, we we work across the, the entirety of the Auckland region um, in many, many different public health functions. And I have the I have particularly the portfolio responsibility for uh, both tobacco and alcohol harm minimization. Hold on. Uh, Anna, Anna there? Uh, yeah. oh, good morning, good morning, everybody. Um, Malolele, my name is Anna Ika. I'm a social policy advocate and analyst with the Salvation Army Social Policy and Parliamentary Unit. Um, and so we're here to pro, um, support um, the notice of motion on behalf of the Salvation Army. Tulafalava, my name is Louisa Salailai. I am the program manager for the alcohol harm minimization program at Counties Monaco Health. I'm speaking on behalf of Counties Monaco Health today. Thank you for your time. And Marina Koto, I'm Dr. Nikki Jackson, the director of Alcohol Health Watch. Um, we're all in support of um, the, the, the motion that's put to you today. Next slide, please. I'm going to give a snapshot of alcohol use uh, in, across Tamaki Makoto. When we look among drinkers in this region, across the three DHBs, we can see more than one in four to almost one in three male drinkers are hazardous drinkers. That's a pattern of drinking that increases the risk of both physical and mental health harm to the drinker and to others. But you can see their significant inequities by ethnicity. Uh, high levels of hazardous drinking among Māori men drinkers, Pacific men drinkers, and also European men drinkers. And inequities by deprivation, with those living in the most deprived neighbourhoods much more likely to be hazardous drinkers. Next slide, please. Among female drinkers, although male drinkers are more likely to drink hazardously, we almost have one in five female drinkers drinking hazardously across the region. Again, we see significant, significant inequities by ethnicity, with Wahine Māori more likely to report hazardous drinking, a high among Pacific women and European and other women drinkers. And again, significant inequities by level of deprivation. Next slide, please. This is a snapshot of alcohol harm in Tamaki Makoto looking at health. So in 2018, when you combine the amount of alcohol-related presentations to both Auckland City and Middlemore hospitals, there's nearly 10,000 presentations in that year. That's about 200 a week, with the weekends um, carrying the burden of, of those presentations. They look like family harm, they look like mistreatment of children, suicide and mental health concerns, road accidents, chronic conditions like cancers and heart disease, disease and also, of course, to significant others and unborn children in whānau through fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Just notice, noticing the cost there to Middlemore, about 15 million to 26 million a year, but also noting on an individual level, the harms for our ED staff navigating some of those um, intoxication cases through abuse and um, disturbances to the space. Next slide, please. Uh, the Salvation Army's mission is to care for people, transform lives and reform society by God's power. Um, our church and combined social services serve over 30,000 individuals and families um, in Auckland. Um, our social services include addiction treatment um, for alcohol, other drugs and gambling, 
Um, we also have food banks, supportive accommodation, um, social and transitional housing, um, to name a few. Uh, many of uh, our families that come through our doors often um, present with issues such as uh, family violence, which uh, Louisa mentioned, um, family violence, debt and financial hardship, um, uh, homelessness um, and food insecurity. Um, but and, and the underlying issue for majority of our clients is often related um, indirectly or directly to um, alcohol harm. And so the Salvation Army on a daily basis sees the detrimental harm of alcohol to the families that we support and care for. Um, some of the key drivers that we believe to um, this alcohol harm that can be addressed is affordability, availability and exposure. Um, according to Alcohol Health Watch research, um, the standard alcohol um, drink in Auckland was 70 cents, um, 77 cents. And so that's a lot cheaper than the price of a bottle of water. 80% of alcohol is now sold at off-license stores. Um, and there is excessive um, exposure to alcohol through advertising and sponsorship. Um, the, this um, disproportionately, these key drivers are exponentially in our poorest communities, like the communities that the Salvation Army serves. Um, for our tangata fire order that come out of our treatment services mm -hmm. um, and also um, come out of our supportive accommodation and return to their communities, there's a proliferation of these key drivers and this doesn't support their road to recovery or to sobriety. Next slide, please. Um, the members bill um, that we're in support of today um, addresses two of the key drivers we mentioned, which is availability and exposure. Um, the bill seeks to remove the appeal of the local alcohol policies. Um, and in 2014, the Salvation Army made a submission in support of Auckland's um, LEP draft. Um, it's now 2022. Um, mm -hmm. Given the current economic, con ec economic climate that we're in and the impacts of COVID-19, um, we believe inequalities will continue to increase um, and this will disproportionately impact the families uh, that we serve here at the Salvation Army. Um, you know, we believe that um, the hardships that our, our families serve will be perpetuated in our COVID-19 impact dashboards, we highlighted that these hardships um, can um, predispose our, our families to alcohol harm. I mean, so that's quite concerning. So uh, LAP for Auckland is not only overdue, but is very much needed. I mean, this bill can address uh, um, LAPs, um, which Nick will talk, to, talk about later. Um, the, the bill also looks at strengthening the DLC's um, criteria um, to look at license applications and address the exposure of um, alcohol sponsorship sponsorship and broadcast sport. Um, uh, research already shows that um, alcohol advertising disproportionately impacts young people and in our state of the nation report released last month showed that hazardous drinking um, impacts um, young Māori and young Pacific um, families. The Salvation Army along with many other community organisations is often um, the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff but we believe there needs to be implementations of barriers and safeguards um, on top of the cliff to prevent our families from tipping over. And we believe this private member bill is one of those safeguards. And so we support it and we encourage the Auckland Council to also support these safeguards um, in preventing our families from tipping over when it comes to alcohol harm. Next slide, please. OK, so I'll um... I'll just cover a little bit about the, the local alcohol policies uh, part of this proposed amendment bill. Um, I mean, as as you'll be aware, uh, Auckland Regional Public Health Service has been walking down this very long road with Auckland Council uh, for a very, very long time. Uh, it's been two and a half thousand days uh, since you first released your provisional local alcohol policy back in May. The idea of the 2012 reforms uh, and the creation of the Sale and Supply of Alcohol Act was to give communities input into the alcohol that's available in their local communities. Um, the intent of the act was to achieve this through two major mechanisms, one being the local alcohol policy and the democratic and consultative processes that uh, that we, have to, that we have to go through and that are set out in the Act um, to, to get public input and to give some local autonomous control. Uh, the other one was the extended criteria for that district licensing committees have to take into account when they're making a decision on, on an individual license application that comes before them uh, in section 105. I'll speak about that a little bit later. Uh, so yeah, it's been, a, it's been a very long, very long road. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is a, 
a brief victorial summary of the the long process, the long and winding road that um, we've been uh, sort of taken on uh, by a lot of the people that have been appealing this process. So, and this this only gets us up to the eighth of June um, through all of the various forums at um, at the the licensing authority. Um, and all of the appeals that have come in, largely from the supermarket duopoly, uh, who enjoy a, a great amount of income um, from from their continued ability to to keep selling without a uh, at particular times of day and in places without the local alcohol policy in place. Uh, we have been to the court of appeal, uh, which found largely in Auckland Council and Auckland Regional Public Health Services' favour. Um, and again, the tactic of, tactic of the supermarkets is to delay, 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 um, going as far as to lodge a uh, um, request to be heard at the Supreme Court. And at this stage, we're, still, we're waiting for uh, the Supreme Court's decision on whether they're going to hear that case. Um, if they say no, then there is still some process to go back to ALA to actually get, the, get this um, provisional policy approved. If the Supreme Court hears that it's going to be years more. Um, this is an incredible ROI for uh, the people, who, the companies in the industry that are appealing the plan, um, because they can, they're paying for the lawyers in every day, and it's not that much in every day that uh, this is delayed. There's a lot of sales of alcohol happening. Uh, if we go to the next slide. And, you know, what's happening in Auckland is also happening around the rest of the country. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, oh, it's eight years past the regulations for local alcohol policies. And although 41 of the 67 councils have a local alcohol policy in place, that only represents 35% of the population because there's no local alcohol policy in Auckland, Hamilton, Wellington and Christchurch. And as Nick said, it's clear that the supermarkets have appealed 86% of the first local alcohol policies. The bottle stores have appealed 72%. And once it's got into the appeals process, uh, it's really watered down the effectiveness of the policies, uh, which, you know, it's, it's amazing to think that Auckland is still in its first local alcohol policy and nine councils are already in their second local alcohol policy, having reviewed their first. Next slide, please. And, you know, this notice of motion today in the private members bill reflects um, wide support across local government in New Zealand in 2018, when 95% of the sector supported the local government remit to amend the sound supply of alcohol act so that LAPs can more accurately reflect community views. Next slide, please. So without a local alcohol policy, communities have to be burdened with objecting to individual license applications, which is totally unfair. We had a promise in the reform bill that, that licenses would become harder to get and easier to lose, and that just hasn't been realised. If we look at the two annual reports of the last two years from the Auckland District Licensing Committee, you can see that between zero and two new on licenses or off licenses were refused per year. And if you combine all license renewals together, you know, less around four, one to four licenses refused. So certainly that just hasn't been realised that licenses have been harder to get. Next slide, please. In regards to um, alcohol availability, there's a strong community con concern about their environment. In Counties Manukau Health, as part of our work, we've been asking our community via social media what they think about alcohol in their environment. We really want to privilege the community voice here. So the quotes are a couple of um, snapshots taken from a handful of interviews that we had with community members in South Auckland. They were asked, what do you think could be done to reduce alcohol-related harms for you, your family and your community? For me, basically stop opening liquor stores. Personally, I think it comes down to accessibility. I live in South Auckland, a lesser closing time, maybe nine o'clock, not so many licenses given out. And finally, I know it's gonna be hard for our bottle store owners. I'm not worrying about their pockets. I'm worrying about our community. The community cares about the environment that they live in and they want to be better heard on these issues as we'll see next. Next slide, please. So as uh, one of the three uh, agencies that's involved in the licensing process, um, Auckland Regional Public Health has, has been to a lot of DLCs and been involved in a lot of um, license applications. Uh, some of our major concerns with the way that this happens at the moment is, is primarily that there is absolutely no 
mechanism within the legislation to give effect to Te Iwa Waitangi. Uh, the, the piece of legislation is lacking any sort of clause that um, requires any of the process, any of the application process to give effect to, to the treaty, um, as would be standard in, in lots of other pieces of legislation, including the RMA. Um, the community participation for licensing is, is really difficult. Um, the, the hearings are one to two full days. They don't give agendas. They don't uh, necessarily allocate speaking times for public objectors. So people have to turn up to the council hall in Papatoitoi or in Manukau and take the whole day off work, sit there, not even know when they're going to be called on to speak. Um, and up until up until recently that the, there hasn't been an opportunity for for using video conferencing for making this an accessible process and then if you do turn up quite often the applicants have hired specialist lawyers from top tier law firms whose job it is to grill these people um, to to try and discredit their their particular concerns about a particular bottle store opening so it's a really unpleasant and, and inaccessible uh, process um, I, I think that the, the access to, to, to justice and to people being heard is, is very poor. Um, and if, if you don't show up, then the oppositions are largely ignored, even if, there is, if there's extensive written evidence. Um, I was at a meeting of DLC chairs just a few days ago where they confirmed this to me that um, they, they put very little weight unless someone, someone turns up. Um, but it is it is so difficult to turn up and it's such an unpleasant experience for a community member who just doesn't want an additional bottle store in their in their community uh, that it's it's hardly surprising that um that people don't hear up and then the community voice is excluded uh from our experience of dlcs um as you saw very very few licenses uh, are opposed and even the ones that are opposed which is only about one percent that go to dlcs 86% of these are granted. Um, so that this is despite opposition from one of the specialist agencies, the police, the, the licensing inspector, or public health, um, who are raising significant concerns about an application going through. Uh, so we, we find that it's even, even when specialist expert agencies are brought in, um, and when, even when there's significant community opposition, uh, it's still very difficult to have an application refused. If we go to the next. If we go to the next slide, and and one of the one of the major reasons for this is that really uh, the DLCs tend to focus on the application that's in front of them. They take a very narrow interpretation um, of of the leg the legislative remit, um, and they really they really only look at the particular application. Uh, in terms of in terms of very narrow criteria of suitability, is, is this person applying for for a, a license a suitable person? Have they in particular um, had any criminal convictions or have have any record of this? But there's very little consideration of the wider context of the harm and the availability. Um, we've only really been seeing any success in making arguments about this community already is saturated in alcohol and is already experiencing high levels of harm in the most deprived and the places with the highest density of outlets. So um, a recent hearing that that I went to that was actually turned down, we had to we had to talk about the fact that there were already 18 off licenses in, Papa, in a one kilometer radius from Papatoetoe. Um, that this additional bottle store, was, I think it was the third or fourth in the Papatoi Toy Town Centre, just wasn't just wasn't required. Um, the process should be aimed at preventing harm, not just limiting the harm that already exists or preventing an exacerbation of it. Uh, the additional Section 105 considerations that are proposed in this bill would give an avenue to do that. They would require DLCs to look and see in the wider context whether there's already a sufficient amount of alcohol in this community um, and also to take into account the harm and the statistics that we that we bring and the police bring to the DLC uh, and apply and apply that sort of understanding of the broader context to this application rather than taking a very narrow, very narrow interpretation and asking and asking whether this particular bottle store will cause harm because that just isn't the way that the harm works and it isn't what isn't the way that public health works. Now, if we go to the next slide. 
Um, moving on from licensing and in, into the alcohol sports sponsorship space, like many of us here in Aotearoa, our tamariki, rangatahi and whanau absolutely adore participating in sports, watching every game, celebrating every win of their favourite team and players. But these people are heroes to our children and to our young people, but it can come at significant cost. Many of our elite teams and competitions in rugby, cricket, golf and netball are sponsored by the alcohol companies. Branding is all over the uniforms, goalposts, around the sports grounds and extended into their social media. The teams we adore are walking signposts for alcohol and our kids see this. Moving on to the next slide, we can see a beautiful quote here from a South Auckland member involved in our project. What they had to say was, yeah, sports and alcohol go hand in hand. Oh, I'm going to watch the game tonight. I'm going to have a beer. Game's on, beer's on. It just becomes a norm. And I don't really believe it is the norm. I don't believe it doesn't have to be the norm. Please go to the next slide. And so we've got lots of questions. I'll just run through this slide. But I just want to say that this private members bill actually supports the work that Auckland Council have already done. In 2018, Auckland Transport prohibited all alcohol advertising on public transport vehicles and infrastructure. So this is really just um, extending that to support others um, in, in the sports arena. And this year, Super Rugby women's teams committed to not using alcohol branding as well. We did it with tobacco, we can do it with alcohol. There's a number of reviews from the government commission bodies that recommend an end to alcohol sports sponsorship. But let's see this as one step, important step towards comprehensive restrictions to alcohol advertising and promotion. Next slide, please. And finally, we, um, we have lots of public support. There is um, strong, this is independent polling from UMR last month uh, in February among Aucklanders. Strong support uh, for government taking stronger action on around alcohol, stronger support for children not being exposed to alcohol advertising, strong support uh, for getting rid of um, alcohol sports sponsorship, and also strong support for the alcohol industry not being involved in developing local or national government policies in relation to alcohol. Next slide, please. Um, in our most recent survey at counties, we also saw that 89% of our respondents supported a full review of the sale and supply of alcohol acts. In our interviews, we also talked a little bit about the amendment bill, and here's what they had to say. First part of Chloe's bill, completely in support of. Communities must have the right to oppose developments that they see as harmful. Take that away is fundamental. That's my biggest criticism of stopping people saying from what they want. They're local, and that's extremely dangerous. And finally, I definitely support that one. The submission process, definitely support that sense of sport. Yep. I definitely support that one, only because for that one, for Polynesian people, that is basically what we do, sports. And so for me, if you find something or you know you equate that, I enjoy this, so then I must enjoy that, you know that goes hand in hand. This is our next slide is our final slide. It is our shared vision to see our unborn babies, tamariki, rangatahi and kapano, growing up in an environment free from the harms of alcohol. We ask that the governing body support all four motions and continue to show strong leadership in contributing to our shared vision. Together on behalf of my colleagues and respective organisations, thank you so much to the governing body for the privilege of expressing our strong support for this amendment bill. Uh, thank, thank, you thank you very much. Very much. That's, uh, That's uh, been a very clear and coherent uh, presentation. Um, I've just got a, a, an initial uh, couple of quick questions. One, uh, you started off on the first slide talking about hazardous drinkers, and I was keen to know what the definition of hazardous drinkers were. And the second question, it might go to, uh, uh, to Nick. Um, I, I've, from time to time, gone down to emergency uh, departments on the weekend, and there's generally a very high percentage of people presenting with alcohol-related illness or injuries. Have you got any up-to-date figures on the number of people typically on a Friday or a Saturday night in any one of our hospital emergency departments that would be there for alcohol-related reasons? So those two questions, I leave it up to you as to who might want to ask, answer those. Well, I'll answer the hazardous drinking question. So the New Zealand Health Survey uses the World Health Organization classification of hazardous drinker which is a 10 question uh, questionnaire and you score eight or more to become a hazardous drinker. So it indicates generally a pattern of drinking or drinking high amounts of alcohol on a regular basis um, that um, gives rise to hazardous drinking. 
we know that a similar proportion would say drink six drinks or more on an occasion at least once a month. Thank you. And the second question, ED departments. Anybody uh, able to help with that? Um, yeah, so uh, the Australasian College for Emergency Medicine um, has done has done surveys on this and they, they have shown that 16% uh, of all ED patients, if you're there on a Saturday morning, are there for alcohol. Um, Saturday, Saturday and Friday, uh, well, Saturday and Sunday mornings in the early hours are, are peak emergency department times. But that's it's really a sort of tip of the iceberg, the very, the very obvious stuff. Um, alcohol is a class one carcinogen. It contributes to numerous different cancers. Um, it causes heart attacks, it causes stroke, it causes chronic liver disease, it causes extreme amounts of mental distress and depression and anxiety and suicide. It's a, a contributing factor to a very high proportion of completed suicides. Um, so we can't we can't just talk about EDs and, and that very obvious stuff. There's this there's this huge bottom of the iceberg sitting under the water. Um, and in, in addition, you know, we've just had the Waitangi Tribunal hearings on fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, where it's not it's not certain what the proportion of people affected in New Zealand are because we've never properly resourced a prevalence survey. Um, but similar places like Canada have have done this and estimate that even up to sort of three to five percent of the entire population is affected, and these are lifelong, you know, potential limiting brain injuries that come with incredible amounts of cost and, and incredible amounts of, of effort on the parts of, of carers and health system and justice systems. Thank you very much for that. Um, now, next question is uh, Councillor Cathy Casey. Yeah, thanks, Phil. And my question relates to the causal effect between alcohol advertising and drinking among young, young people. And I'd just like to refer to two studies. And thank you, Josephine Bartley, Councillor, for bringing this before us. This is exactly what Auckland Council should be doing, advoca advocating for the minimisation of harm from, article, from, from alcohol. But the two studies that um, Josephine Bartley mentions in her notice of motion, and we have heard through the regulatory committee that had a huge impact on me, is what I'd like to hear about too. One was that 90% of bottle stores in my ward, Albert Eden Puki Tapapa and Ota Otara Papa Toi Toi, 90% of them infringed our signs by law and 70% had uh, two or more infringements. So that's one study that had me gobsmacked. But the other was another one, very recent, where um, children from age 11 to 13 were found to be exposed to advertising about alcohol about four or, five, four or five times a day, and that the bulk of that, or at least 35% of that, came from sports and 25% from merchandise and other from sports venues. So it all ties into this bill that... that uh, that Chloe's put forward. So I'm interested just in a bit of the causal the causal relationship between all of this and young people that can, can be set in the path to drinking hard. Yeah. I'm happy to answer that. So when we look at really high quality studies, so longitudinal designs that follow people over time that they haven't started drinking or they haven't started drinking heavily and they're exposed to advertising, what the studies show is that Increased exposure to advertising increases the likelihood of starting to drink earlier and then starting to drink more heavily. And so they've actually concluded now using a bunch of criteria that alcohol advertising is a causal factor in youth drinking. Now, this is a real problem because you know 50 percent of alcohol abuse and disorder cases in New Zealand are developed by the age of 20. So this is a really vulnerable period to, you know, we're trying to reduce alcohol addiction in this country. One of the key things we can turn down is, is the advertising the promotion. Thank you. I might, I might just say there, Councillor, that um, you, you may be misremembering some of the statistics because it was 100% of bottle stores in, oh, in, right. our, in, our, in, in, our, in Auckland Regional Public Health Services, South Auckland survey uh, that were non-compliant with the signage bylaw. Oh. And, and essentially, every one of those bottle stores is an enormous billboard for alcohol, for cheap alcohol. Great. Thanks, Nick. 
Thank, thank you very much for that. Um, look, that's been a that's been a, a very clear and persuasive uh, presentation. I suspect that you may be preaching to the converted here, um, so I, I wasn't expecting a, a large number of questions. But I, I think your presentation was was really helpful in the discussion that we'll shortly have. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to now move to. Um, uh, Member of Parliament for our uh, Auckland uh, Central area, Chloe Swarbrick. Uh, welcome, Chloe. Um, I hope the COVID is not treating you too badly, and I equally hope that I had no part to play in <laughs> your contracting it. Um, um, if uh, we give you about five minutes, and then uh, then open it up for for questions, and just saying by way of a forward that the very first. Uh, bill I ever put into the ballot in Parliament 41 years ago was to try to ban alcohol advertising. So there you go, 41 years and we're still trying. Um, Chloe, welcome welcome along today. Kia ora, I love that as an opening gambit. Tēnā koe mea goaf, tēnā koutou councillors, me mehi kā tika ki te mana whenua ki a nga te whātua o ora kei no inarangi no te mana hoki o ku tipuna. E whānau mai ahau e tāma ki makaurau a tipu ake ahau e reira. Nō reira, Chloe Swarbrick, tēnei e mehi atu ana ki a koutou katoa. Thank you for having me. Well, barely a day goes by that we don't hear about alcohol harm in our communities, but years have gone by without meaningful political action, and Phil, that's probably about 40 odd years now. <laughs> Uh, I, I want to thank the community experts and the health professionals for their incredibly detailed and evidence-based submission before me, but also for their continued advocacy in the face of a huge amount of lobbying power. Now, you'll all know that there are two major types of parliamentary bills that dominate parliamentary process. There are government bills, which are proposed by members or ministers in cabinet, rather, which take up the majority of House and select committee time. Members' bills are the other, which get heard one day every fortnight after being pulled from the luck of the biscuit tin. You'll likely be aware that Minister Farfoy intends to review the Sale and Supply of Alcohol Act, Act in this term of Parliament. This could hopefully result in a government bill to reduce alcohol harm. However, we do not yet have any guarantee of action from this eventual review, nor do we have a timeline. In fact, unfortunately, we are swimming in reviews. In 2010, the Law Commission recommended a suite of changes to alcohol laws, including ending advertising outright. In 2014, under the former national government, a ministerial forum led by Sir Graham Lowe recommended ending alcohol sponsorship and advertising in sport. In the last term of Parliament, the Government Commission, Te Ara Oranga, the Mental Health and Addiction Inquiry, and Turuki Turuki, the Safe and Effective Justice Review. Recommendation 26 of the Mental Health and Addiction Inquiry recommended, and I quote, take a stricter regulatory approach to the sale and supply of alcohol informed by the recommendations from the 2010 uh, Law Commission Review, the 2014 Ministerial Forum on Alcohol Advertising and Sponsorship, and the 2014 Ministry of Justice Report on Alcohol Pricing. The Safe and Effective Justice Review echoed exactly those same sentiments, stating, and I quote, we recommend stronger regulation of alcohol. Over recent decades, governments have ignored many recommendations aimed at reducing the harm and impact of alcohol misuse. Kia ora oranga, the 2010 Law Commission Review, Alcohol in Our Lives, the 2014 Ministerial Forum on Alcohol Pricing, all recommended our provided evidence for a stronger regulatory approach to the sale and supply of action, of alcohol rather. Bolder political leadership is required here to take action now. You can see all of this is incredibly self-referential and circular because we have had a lot of reviews. This is an opportunity for action with an already drafted bill ready to have its day in Parliament. In this term of Parliament, standing orders were changed, and this is really important with regard to the motion, which means that members' bills no longer have to rely on the luck of the ballot drawer. They can, if they get the support of 61 non-executive members of Parliament, bypass the ballot to get to the debating floor. That is why I'm asking for your support as the largest council in this country with substantial experience and especially the failings on special appeals. If we can get the signatures and support of 61 non-executive, that is not ministers or undersecretaries, MPs across the House, 
we can get this bill uh, into the debating chamber and no longer leave progress on this critical issue to chance. As councillors, you know this problem intimately. You've seen it in your communities. But you also know it because of the cost and the waste of time for council. Council has spent over a million dollars and seven years trying to finalise its own local alcohol policy. The removal of special appeals processes will allow communities to make their own rules about where and how alcohol is sold. I think that's basic democracy. The other half of this bill seeks to sever the tie between sports and alcohol, implementing recommendations from reviews that we have seen language since the early 2010s. As Dr Nikki Jackson has shown, there is overwhelming public support to just do it. I could say a lot more, uh, but I'm aware of my time limit, so I'll leave it with this final point that too often local government is the recipient of law from central government that is just frankly totally unworkable. On the issue of alcohol harm, my member's bill seeks to give power back to fix this. I am hopeful that it has your support so that we can end the parliamentary logjam and finally finally do something that works. I want to uh, thank in particular Councillor Bartley and the council officials who I know have been working hard on this motion uh, behind the scenes as well as Councillor Collins for his seconding the motion uh, and hopefully all of council for your support. Thank you very much Chloe, you packed a lot into uh, that period of time. Um, I have a question, first question in the name of uh, Deputy Mayor Bill Cashmore. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Excuse me. And thank you, Chloe. Um, I chaired the Auckland LAP hearings panel when we did it a, a lifetime ago. It felt like we had 10,000 submissions. We did a good process. We came up with a fairly good result that was balanced. And yet we've gone through this ridiculous million dollar appeals process, which is the, the law is not fit for purpose. So I'm supporting you, you and your bill. The question I have, though, is that as far as the uh, decoupling of alcohol sponsorship of sports, and um, do you have a number, a modern number, because I've got an old number, but a modern number of what that actual quantum is? Yeah, so unfortunately, the most recent quantification that we have is from that 2014 ministerial forum, and it was approximated at around 21 million. But we know that at that point in time, around 75% of those funds were going to rugby union in particular. Um, with regard to how we could alternatively fund that, there actually is currently a lever inside of excise taxes, so the government could very easily recycle that back into uh, kind of filling that gap. The other would be, of course, just to front up with a pot of money. However, we did hear really similar concerns about uh, kind of the removal of funds when we sought to do exactly the same thing with ending tobacco advertising in the 90s. However, we saw quite quickly that there was a flood of other alternatives that came in to support sports. Yes, thanks. I just wanted the councils to hear that the money, the sum of money we talk about here is not that large in the scheme of things compared to the harm that's caused. So thank you. Yeah. Well, good luck. Good, thank good. you, Deputy Mayor. Good question. Thank you very much. Uh, next question, Councillor John Watson. Yes, thanks, Mr. Mayor. And, and I think Clyde really um, answered my question. I, I guess just in terms of that historic figure, I think of, of 21 million, uh, at the local level, certainly there used to be pretty extensive um, you know, liquor advertising at clubs um, for a variety of reasons, not least of which is the kind of decline in uh, local sport um, cert um, certainly in, in codes like rugby and with the advent of Super 15 and all the rest of it, that, that's that been with, withdrawn, um, you know, over the last couple of decades. So I'm just curious to know if, if, if that um, advertising we're talking about is really on the, you know, on the big national and provincial level, because I don't think there's too much around at, at local level, certainly not in relation to, to what it was in years gone by. Mm, kia ora, councillor. Yeah, it definitely is the case that that figure encompasses all uh, advertising and sponsorship at both a local and a national level. But as you well point out, alongside that withdrawal of kind of support for grassroots codes, there also uh, has been a number of codes, including in um, professional kind of televised sports that have shown that leadership, as was evidenced by uh, the submission before mine. I'd also say uh, that we're behind the eight ball on this one. So for many years, France and North Way have prohibited sports sponsorship by alcohol companies and in 2018 Ireland started that as well. Um, Western Australia has also been looking at doing exactly this too. Thank you very much uh, and the last question I have in front of me is from Councillor Chris Starby. 
Thank you, Mayor. Kia ora, Chloe. Thank you for this. I commend the bill. Uh, just a quick one for you, Chloe. Um, in terms of uh, this, I think it's the A Roman 2, um, winding down advertising and sponsorship of sports. Um, um, can you just explain why that doesn't go further to cultural events? And I'm mindful of places of congregation where young people are exposed to um, um, you know, advertising from, um, you know, your Heinekens and Coronas, et cetera, being at the raft of cultural events that uh, happen in uh, Tamaki Makaurau and throughout New Zealand. Uh, for example, um, Splore. Uh, Splore's major sponsor is Corona. Um, and then, of course, we come to some of our own theatres where on the programs of maybe the opera or maybe it's the, um, uh, the, the Auckland Theatre Company, um, you know, the bottles of champagne are advertised, all exposing, you know, um, you know, uh, young people uh, to uh, those products. So can you just explain why, has, why hasn't it, um, and there could be a good reason, why you haven't extended past sports into uh, events as I've outlined. Jeff. Yeah, kia ora, councillor. Um, in a nutshell, I would love to have done that. <laughs> um, it is unfortunately the case that a member's bill has to take a relatively specific, defined, discrete area and try and push ahead with doing exactly that. So, um, you know, we know that advertising, sponsorship and exposure normalises and glamorises a substance. It's why we chose to end, our, uh, sorry, tobacco advertising and sponsorship in the 90s. It's also also why I might add on a, another controversial piece of legislation that was before all of us in the last election with the proposed regulation of potential cannabis, uh, we were also prohibiting the advertising and the sponsorship because we know that normalising and glamorising through those processes is not the way that you reduce harm. So uh, I, in a perfect world, I would love to be progressing a bill as uh, it seems that the mayor did <laughs> uh, back in the day uh, to end advertising and sponsorship outright of alcohol, given that, you know, this is not talking about people who want to drink at the end of the day or whatever else being prohibited from doing that, but from the processes of normalising and glamorising that substance. It is, however, unfortunately the case that with a member's bill, you've only got to bite off as much as you can chew. So to that effect, I've chosen those two key areas of ending the special appeals process for LAPs, given the pain that it has caused in Auckland and in councils across the country, but also to implement those really straightforward recommendations of the 2014 ministerial forum. Thank you very much, uh, Chloe, and thank you for, again, a, a very clear uh, and uh, coherent uh, presentation to councillors today. I'm, I'm going to ask um, councillors Josephine Bartley and councillors Zafeso uh, Collins to move and second a motion of thanks for Louisa, Nikki, Nick, Anna and Chloe. Um, so if you both councillors are happy to do that, which I presume they are. Um, yep, uh, I'll put the motion of thanks. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. I declare that carried. And, and once again, thank uh, uh, the presenters for some, some, some really good presentations. Um, I have one other motion on screen. I, I mentioned earlier um, the two uh, people who wanted to submit weren't able to make it today. That was Steve Randerson from Kayard and James Yellop from to uh, uh Waipiro. Um, and James has uh, tabled a public input uh, or has sent us a public input um, that uh, we will table. And the second motion, I'll ask the same councillors if they can uh, to move this motion that we note the tabled in, uh, public input from to Whakahi uh, Waipero. Happy to do that, councillors? Yep. Happy to second. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Contrary, no. I declare that carried. Um, Thanks, uh, councillors. We come now to item number seven, local board input. There has been none received. Uh, item number eight is extraordinary items. Uh, I have not been informed of any extraordinary items. Item number nine is notices of motion. And as you will have already gathered under uh, Standing Order 2.5.1, a notice of motion has been received from councillor Josephine Bartley, seconded by councillor Fessel Collins for consideration under item 10. 
Um, so we'll now move to item 10, and uh, this will be debated in the, the normal way. Um, so uh, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Councillor Bartley to move the motion and to Councillor Fessel Collins to speak in seconding it. Um, any councillor is welcome to take a call, but uh, just to recommend that if a point's already been made by somebody, um, uh, please don't feel obliged to repeat it again at length. And secondly, um, my intention would be to take it uh, the, the uh, recommendations on voices, unless a, a division is uh, called for, in which case we would have a division. Uh, and if any councillor wants the recommendations to be taken separately, we can do that as well, but please indicate to me. Otherwise, my intention is to take the recommendations together. So could I now call on Councillor Josephine Bartley, please, to speak to her, her notice of motion. Uh, Councillor Bartley. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Tina Kato Katoa, your mumu lava on our fat talo for Atu, but your malimumalu or the Ophia Ne, my lolly so for more, Malilangi Mama. Thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to speak to this item and to receive the notice of motion. Uh, thank you to Chloe Swarbrick, MP, for uh, coming to us with this and asking for our support and acknowledging the role that we all play as leaders in our community for this city. Um, thank you to all those that spoke in public forum today and for all those that are continuously going to the DRC hearings and standing up for their communities. I don't want to cry. Okay. Um, yeah, and fighting for their communities because all of us as councillors, we all know the harm that our communities are experiencing from alcohol. I, I was all set for today, but I've been taking calls from media, from residents, um, everybody, is, they're just so scared in my community in Glen Innes right now because of the shootings last night or early this morning uh, where six people were injured, random shootings. Um, and, you know, you can't help but make the comparison. I mean, the, the connection, we have 11 off licenses within two kilometres of each other in Glen Innes. There is a connection between harm and alcohol and the easy access to alcohol in our communities. But if I go back to my actual speech, so the purpose of the act for the benefit of, was to be for the benefit of our communities. Um, that was the purpose that's in the legislation. The purpose was for the benefit of our communities. As we can hear today from public forum, from everything that we know as leaders in our communities, there is no benefit to our communities from this legislation. Those of us who are still single will understand or know the term catfishing. And that is what we have been sold by this legislation as a city. We've been catfished because this legislation is not for the benefit of our communities. We've seen uh, liquor license off licenses go up. In 2016, our off licenses were 823. March, like this month, our off licenses, um, 1,126. It is just so easy to get alcohol. Last night I was, um, I went to go get um, some milk. So milk, this is from um, GI, $2.80, one liter of milk. A can of alcohol, $1.80. It's just too easy, too cheap, too accessible. So many off licenses in our low income communities and this low alcohol policy would have given us some protection. But in the meantime, we're all sitting ducks because, you know, of the court action. But when this first came out in 2015, and I acknowledge our deputy mayor who was chairing the local alcohol policy hearings, you know, it's taken its toll on him as well. Not only has he gone grey, but his hairline is receding. But not only the effect that it's taken on, on us as a council, on, on councillors, but the effect that it's had on our communities. At the time, I had uh, an area in my um, community, Point England, no liquor stores in Point England. That's between Pamua and GI. And that was one of the areas that was going to be under this priority overlay. And I was so hopeful that we would protect the area from getting any liquor stores. 50% uh, 
uh, of the area earns 19,000. Um, no, the majority earn under 19,000, 50% are single moms. And I wanted to protect that area. And I was counting on this, this legislation and this LAP to do that. And now we're just sitting ducks. All of our areas that are in the priority overlay, all sitting ducks. Otahu, Mount Wellington, Manurewa, Mangere East, GI, Clemden, Avondale, Wellsford, Takanini, all of us sitting ducks. So I hope we do support this bill because this will be some way to help protect our communities in the future. Um, in terms of normalizing alcohol, that is the part, the second part of what this bill will protect is the alcohol advertising in sports and hopefully uh, removing that because a lot of things go towards normalizing alcohol in our communities. It is not normal to go and buy a box of Cody's and a, a bread while you're, you know, you're you're taking your kids to school. That is not normalized behavior that we want to see. A lot of acknowledgements. I don't know what my timing is, but I just want to do the acknowledgements now before I get um, told that I'm out of time. Acknowledging KYAD for the work they've done to bring forward public forum, Jordan, uh, Mikey Tuala, and the work they're constantly doing in our communities. Um, Wayne Le Leverick, Leverick Councillor Al Filipina, uh, for the safety uh, working group and bringing us, myself and Councillor Collins, into that and the alcohol advocacy plan. And I hope this goes some way to achieving some of the goals in your plan. Um, our CSAs, my senior CSA, uh, Joe Wood, and uh, who left for England, and now Jason Howarth. This goes to show the quality, like that notice of motion is outstanding. I wish I could take credit for it, but I'm not because it was their work. Like this just shows the quality that comes out of um, our democracy services. So thank you very much, Joseph and Jason. Uh, again, I thank Chloe for her bill, Councillor Collins for seconding it. You may not have known that you were seconding it, but thank you very much. You were seconding it. Um, and what our licensing team do out there, our licensing inspectors, DLC, you know, a lot of our council staff, they want to do the right thing by our communities, but they feel hamstrung by the legislation. So rather than sweat and blood ourselves out there picketing and doing all the protests outside these liquor stores and going to the DRC and objecting in the DRC and not getting heard, the best way is to target the legislation. Go straight to it. So, you know, the legislation doesn't do anything to protect our community. So thank you, Chloe, for bringing this to the fore. Uh, thank you, councillors, for um, giving this some time and for what you guys are all doing, like me, in our communities to try and make them a better place and make our city a better place. Uh, I don't think I have anything else to add. I think that covers it. Um, yeah. yeah. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Bartley, and um, our sympathy for the incident that occurred at Heatherbank Street um, the early hours of this morning in Glen Innes. Um, hugely concerning. Six people uh, shot uh, and two uh, seriously injured, five in hospital. Um, that's a that's a terrible reflection on um, a, a trend towards the greater use of firearms in our community, and maybe and the way alcohol and drug. Yeah, and we, we and I, I, I I don't know, and I, I guess none of us yet know what was behind this. Um, that could well be the case that alcohol and drugs was behind it. That that is the norm in our uh, in in incidents of this kind. Um, but yeah, we'll be following. Um, the police inquiries on that very, very closely, but uh, our sympathy for that happening in uh, in your home area. I'm going to ask um, uh, Councillor Collins now to speak, and then I'll open it up for questions. And following questions, uh, I'll open it up for any broader comments that anybody wants to make. So in seconding the motion, uh, Councillor Collins. Oh, kia ora, Mayor, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. And thanks for taking this notice of motion as well and putting it on the agenda. I think it's extremely important. I want to uh, endorse the words of my colleague and friend, uh, Councillor Josephine Bartley, the emotion that was in that, the reality of that emotion, uh, and uh, for outlining parts of the, the law. So it's good we've got some lawyers around the governing body table because they can help us with that. I thought having seen the question or the, the the note that Dr Casey put on the sidebar around catfishing, I haven't been a victim of myself uh, to catfishing Dr Casey, but I did a quick Google search and it says that when we create uh, fake online profiles to trick 
people into finding love so that we can get money out of them. Well, Josephine, Councillor Bartley, I think that catfishing is the exact term that we should be using uh, this morning because that's exactly what's happened. Our communities have been fooled into finding a friend and these industries are getting mega money out of our vulnerable, exploited and poorer communities and they have definitely been giving up their money. Today we've heard about the direct causal relationship between alcohol advertising and how damaging it is when people are drinking. We've also been reminded of how terrible the DLC process is for many of our communities. That the whole purpose of <clears throat> adding these different these uh, amendments earlier on to the sale of and supply of liquor act was to ensure that communities felt empowered. This has been disempowering for our communities. I, when I was chair of the Otara Papa Toy Toy local board, I would sit in those meetings and feel like I was on suits or something. When the lawyers that they would come in with these big fancy lawyers whose hair had like a bottle of gel in them. They'd come in with their white shoes and they, you know, like a stiletto footing. And I'd feel completely insignificant and inferior as the lawyer would cross-examine me, thinking, if I'm struggling with this and I've got a wonderful support team beside me, how are our communities supposed to feel? It feels like they're being put on trial. They've been asked to give up whole days out of work. These are just our community members who are ordinary people who want to enjoy their community. We talk about this all the time when it comes to property rights, the, the ability to peacefully enjoy what we have. And communities aren't enjoying their communities because we've got these bottle stores everywhere. I had a couple of Papa Toy Toy bottle store owners ring me only a few weeks ago to say, what are you doing supporting this FSL? Why are you seconding this? And I'm saying, yeah, I understand that you want to make money, but at the end of the day, you might be a responsible person, that's cool, but at the end of the day, if you put a heat map over our poorer and exploited communities, you will find that we are inundated with off licenses premises. And so it's not good for our community and we are suffering as a result of this. I wanted to thank Chloe and uh, Chloe, I, I, uh, we were only on a meeting a couple of days, or yesterday it was, when we were talking about homelessness in particular for our young people and the challenges that they face. And in your words, Chloe, one of the things you talked about, Chloe, was bold political leadership. This is the time for all of us to show leadership for our communities, for the communities that feel left out and marginalised and exploited and continue to be so. For some strange reason, alcohol has been the hope for our communities. It's not. It's a, it's a complete failure uh, to our communities because it's so detrimental and it's so harmful. I was reflecting as I was preparing and then your catfish comment caught me a little bit off guard there, Councillor Bartley, and so I thought it was best that as the seconder, as your support crew today, that I, I tune in with the catfish comment. But I've been reflecting on, on the words of King Solomon, in fact, and who wrote the Proverbs. And King Solomon wrote, hope deferred makes the heart weak. And I think this is about hope. This is about ensuring that we stand beside vulnerable, exploited communities and offer them the hope that they deserve. And I think they have had weakened hearts because we're the families that see the result of the binge drinking of all of this access to alcohol in our communities. Every day when we leave and, and um, we're heading out the door so that Gapiriela can go to school, we pass three alcohol stores just by walking hey, across the park and into where, our, where we're parked. That's unacceptable. It is, it is normal. We have normalised alcohol stores where they're just there. They're there and they're bright. I think it's an orange colour or a green colour. And it's, it's normal. And my daughter looks at it and she says, wow, Dad, they're everywhere. And I said, yeah, they shouldn't be everywhere. And they shouldn't be everywhere, especially in poorer communities. So I would welcome all of our councillors to support this motion today. I want to say thanks heaps to Josephine, who has been adamant that we've got to do more. We've seen the harm in Māngere, communities like Māngere and Glen Innes, communities that she knows really well. All of us have seen that harm everywhere. Today, we can put a real stake in the sand 
a, and say, this is not acceptable anymore. We want the best for our communities. We want them to feel safe. We want them to feel empowered and emboldened and knowing that they own these spaces. Because that's what we're about. We're about place making, space shaping or spatial planning and about local connection. And by supporting this, uh, this motion today and in, in the hope that the bill goes through, then we can say alongside our, our communities that we are about providing hope, hope for our community so that they can get right past all of the, the sadness and the depression that exists from these alcohol stores that are everywhere. So well done to my good friend and colleague, Councillor Bartley, and I would recommend this, uh, this motion to everybody. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, so we'll take questions first. Uh, I have one question uh, in the name of Councillor Desley Simpson. Uh, so if you've got another question, please get it in the uh, the sidebar as quickly as possible. Um, Councillor Simpson. Thanks, Mayor. Look, I'm just asking around uh, point 37 and the supporting information, and that's around current. Uh, um, I think there's a you know I'm worried about the sporting groups that potentially will lose the money that's actually needed to run these clubs. I sub absolutely support the intent, but I'm just wondering what support that count we think that council can make, because this point 37 says um, that basically we're asking these groups to, many of whom may be dependent on revenue collected by alcohol marketing, um, to actually join the select committee process now, that'll be an expensive exercise for them. What sort of support can we give them? And do we have confidence that there will be other sponsors that will be able to come in and um, and take the role of, that alcohol currently plays? So that, uh, that question is then to uh, the sponsor of the Notice of Motion, uh, Josephine Bartley. Uh, so, Councillor Bartley, if you, you need to, if you'd like to respond to that. Okay, thank you, Worship. Thank you, Councillor Simpson. Um, Dr. Nikki Jackson mentioned the work, oh, yeah, and Chloe can also speak to this, mentioned the work that they had done about alternative sources for funding and support for our sporting codes. When I was on the local board, we did a lot of work there as well um, for alternatives for our sports groups uh, in terms of funding, besides funding from gambling. So I'm assuming we can do the same and extend that to um, alcohol. But uh, I'll let Chloe also speak to this because she's got some information too. Oh, kia ora, um, if I may. Apologies, I'm not familiar with the protocols. No, of, um, probably, probably out of order, but let's uh, hear it anyway. Oh, look, it's just quite funny. <laughs> I'm happy. Sorry. Thank you, Your Worship, for allowing that, yes. Yeah. Apologies. Um, uh, yeah, I was just going to um, refer uh, members to the um, link that I've put in here from Otago University uh, blog, which links through to a number of different alternatives. So there's obviously the excise tax is an opportunity here. Yes. So too is a uh, um, pot of funding, which the government may make available. Um, but I'd also um, remind members of the same kinds of fears that we heard about the sky falling in when tobacco advertising was banned and sponsorship in the 90s um, and those other jurisdictions around the world that have done exactly this and seen that there hasn't been the problems and the leadership that we've seen from some grassroots and professional codes to no longer take um, alcohol advertising. Thank yep. you. So supplementary, Your Worship. So you're in, in supporting A2, wind down alcohol advertising and sponsorship of sport. That gives a bit of time for some other options to come in. This is not a stop go thing. It's more about a bit of a winding down and some options in that as far as that um, um, select committee process. It's, you're not going to turn it off overnight. Is that we just is there a bit of time in there or? Yes, there's time. And as we know, with alcohol, nothing happens overnight. <laughs> I, I, I think the clear example of how we did away with tobacco sponsorship would be followed uh, in the event. Yeah. Uh, you know, nobody wants to punish the sports clubs uh, that need the, the support. Um, you know, you could put the excise tax up by a, by a, a cent or two and then pay the money directly to the sports clubs without them having to sell their soul to uh, to, to promote uh, alcohol advertising. So the, the target will be the, uh, uh, the the people that make the money out of the, uh, the, the alcohol rather than the sports clubs that um, 
presumably we can compensate for that loss of uh, loss of income. Anyway, uh, it's not my role to answer questions. My apologies for that. Uh, are there any other questions before we move to comments? I, I have no other questions signalled. Uh, so I'll move to comments now. And the first request is uh, from Councillor Richard Hills. Councillor Hills. Kia ora, and thank you to all the um, speakers who spoke earlier and Chloe for the bill and um, Josephine and Efeso for uh, this notice of motion, obviously definitely support it and just remember the process and as um, Deputy Mayor said as well, as a local board member, I remember being involved with the process back then and it seeming like all was going to be a fantastic idea and everything would be addressed. Uh, uh, one figure that stuck with me at the time, which maybe it shouldn't be quoted in case uh, my memory is not or it's not accurate anymore, but I remember the proliferation in South Auckland, I think was 11 times the number of liquor stores than say in my community on the North Shore. And so uh, that was pretty shocking to me. Um, it may be worse now, it may be um, that I'm not remembering that figure from seven or eight years ago, <clears throat> but I was just uh, shocked. But you do, you go around the communities in um, uh, predominantly South Auckland and see there are liquor stores near the library, there are liquor stores near the schools, there are liquor stores near the youth centres, there are liquor stores on every main street and several of them and all the dairies sell the um, alcohol too. And I just think that is obvious um, when you hear the local board speak up over and over, um, come to the governing body, they come to um, the presentations, they talk about how they feel powerless and helpless and it feels pointless speaking up to the um, independent uh, hearing panel members on the DLCs. I've spoken to some of the DLC members and they feel powerless because often they will give really good uh, points and evidence and oppose uh, certain things, but it all falls down because actually under the law, um, the threshold wasn't strong enough. But, you know, everyone, it's the hard thing with anecdotal evidence um, to try and back up some sort of magical threshold that the, the bill sets is that you can see the harm, you know the harm's there, you talk to everyone about the harm in our community, but then nothing changes because there's some bizarre threshold um, set by this process that is is clearly failing our communities. And clearly, as um, Councillor Bartley says, with those numbers growing um, sort of 20% in, um, in the time that's supposed to have been reducing those numbers. So. Um, just want to back this up. We are a country that is surrounded by alcohol. It's 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 seen as the thing you celebrate with, the thing that you encourage, the exciting thing to share with your friends as a young person. I will say the good stats, uh, the Youth 2000 stats across the last uh, 12 years have seen a, a, a significant reduction in young people drinking. So I think what we need to do is ensure that um, that we aren't then bringing those young people into communities. Um, when they haven't been drinking, which is great, into areas where they suddenly have access all around them, no matter where they go, because there's so many bottle stores. Um, so I just want um, to talk about all the work done here, and I think it's you know another step forward, and hopefully we can get some more action um, to reduce the harm to our community. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Hills. I, I don't have any other comments on the list, but I, I'll just make a very brief comment myself. Um, 2,500 days since we put in place the local alcohol policy and a million dollars of ratepayer funds used taken up in court costs uh, because vested interests from promoting the sale and making money out of alcohol uh, have decided to stymie the wishes of our local communities and that that simply isn't good enough um, we we've seen enough and i don't need to elaborate on what the cost of uh, the cost of alcohol abuse has been? Uh, just the, the vivid memory I had as a member of parliament uh, dealing with children uh, who suffered from fetal alcohol syndrome. One of the saddest, saddest things that I've ever had to deal with, and that cost is not just a one-off cost; it's a lifetime cost. So you know, I'm saying this as somebody who drinks alcohol, um, but usually not to excess, um, but. We have to have a situation where we can curb the sale of alcohol and, you know, going back to what happened in Glen Innes last night without preempting uh, something, the, the explanation for that. Uh, I know from what the police say to me uh, that the real problem is the hours of opening of our off, off licenses. 
that people have had a skinful of alcohol and then decide, um, you know, at 10 o'clock at night that they'll go down and top up at the bottle store. Um, there are things that we can do to limit the social harm. And we ought not to be promoting uh, the consumption of alcohol. People wish to consume alcohol, fine, uh, but we shouldn't be setting that up as the pathway to uh, how you can enjoy life and, and, and have a wonderful lifestyle, because often it results in the opposite. Um, I just want to make one last point. Um, I remember the first time I ever went to Chicago and I went into some of the deprived neighbourhoods and they were um, almost exclusively black neighbourhoods. And there are only three so sorts of shops that were open there. Uh, one were pawnbrokers, two were gun shops, and the third were liquor stores. And, you know, I could get on my high horse and say, what a terrible society that produces a community like that. But have a look at where the predominance of liquor stores are located in our own city, and it is in the lower income communities. Uh, and, you know, they are targeting uh, the people that probably can least afford uh, to be targeted by the promotion of alcohol and the cost of alcohol in so many different ways to their lives. So uh, I'm very much supportive of Councillor Bartley's notice of motion, uh, seconded by Councillor Collins. Uh, I thank her uh, and the people that have worked on this notice of motion. Uh, and uh, I, I, for one, would be certainly endorsing it. So um, I have... One other comment that I've now received, uh, Councillor Chris Darby. Yeah, th thanks, Mayor. And um, look, I do support this notice of motion. Don't get me wrong. I just do want to follow up on the point I made to Chloe. And I appreciate that you need to narrow your area of focus down sometimes when you're writing a bill, Chloe, and um, and and you have. But I, I just want to point out a somewhat of a dichotomy here. Um, and it is really important that we focus in on the sponsorship of sport. That's important. Um, but alcohol harm is not just related to the sponsorship of rugby league and rugby and some other major sports. Uh, if you go to where uh, major youth uh, congregations focuses, like Splore, the principal sponsor there is Corona. If I go to the Auckland Arts Festival, our, one of our festivals in our venues... Uh, it is sponsored by Villa Maria and a French wine company. If I go to the Auckland Theatre Company, Villa Maria pop up again, and the list goes on. So there's an issue here, and there's follow-up work for us to do. By supporting this today, we are actually saying, we, we, well, we actually have it upon ourselves now to follow up on the sponsorship that is directly under our control right now. We have Splore, occurring, sponsored by Corona, in one of our own regional parks, um, Auckland Festival, in our own arenas, etc. So we actually do have our own work to do as well. And I think this bill has just identified that work that we have a responsibility for, that it will not be able to capture unless it's amended, and it could possibly be amended, and um, Councillor, Coll Councillor Bartley and Councillor Collins might consider such an amendment to, for it to extend into cultural events. I think it needs to encompass all. Because remember, it is the lawmakers that sip the tattinger at you know, the opera and the arts festivals who write those laws. We should not be left off the hook. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Darby. Uh, I'll now come to a right of reply if she wishes to exercise it by uh, Councillor Bartley. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. No, I'm good. I don't think I need to reply. I think everything that needs to be said has been said. I need to go and deal with a lot of the neighbours that are freaking out by the shooting. So the less talk, more action, the better. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bartley. So I'll put this motion. Uh, I'll do it on the voices. I've had no other request. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Uh, I declare that carried, and I just want to check uh, that I can declare that carried unanimously if there's no opposition to that. 
Okay, it's been carried unanimously. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Councillor Bartley. Thank you, uh, Chloe Swarbrick, for uh, having that bill before Parliament. We wish you well in it, and I hope that you get support uh, that it can go straight into Parliament rather than waiting uh, for the, the lottery system that operates on members' bills. And thank you also uh, to uh, those who have uh, made presentations today in favour of that. Um, thank, you, Mayor. thank you, councillors. Thank you, everybody. And, uh, Sorry, Bill, about you don't you don't look old. Sorry. Right, I, I <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Um, uh, thank you very much for that, everyone. Um, we now move to item 11 uh, on the agenda, which is Maori representation in local government, uh, the timeline for further work. Um, I welcome Rose Leonard, our manager of governance services and also Warwick McNaughton, McNaughton, our principal advisor. I think I've also got in attendance Andrew Firth, Libby Orr and Kim Bellingham. Uh, just to remind uh, councillors that we workshopped this last week. Uh, the recommendations are very narrow recommendations, which is to agree to a timeline uh, and, uh, to, uh, and to note the, um, the feedback. Uh, from engagement from with Mana Whenua will come back to us in August of this year. Uh, so we're not making any substantive decisions on this motion, but simply agreeing to take the next step. Uh, just to remind people too, uh, that uh, we currently have a position adopted by a governing body on a number of occasions uh, for uh, the adoption of Maori wards subject to uh, a change in legislation in Parliament, so it doesn't come at the expense of general wards, uh, and that uh, the system that we're currently supporting is based on the parliamentary model. Uh, but the consultation uh, will look, as it has been agreed to with the IMSB, uh, for alternative models, in particular the Royal Commission model as well. But that's not what we're deciding today. Today we're simply deciding uh, the timeline for the work and for uh, uh, that, that feedback will be given to us in August. Um, noting also, and this will be my last point, that um, I, I think when you change uh, a system of representation uh, for the future, uh, that that decision is more appropriately made by an incoming rather than an outcoming council. And that decision uh, would therefore be made uh, presumably late in the year. But Rose, I'll ask you to, uh, to introduce the item and speak to it, please. Um, kia ora, Mia Goff and tēnā koutou katoa. Um, just to recap a little bit, councillors, since 2015, Auckland Council has signalled its support for di directly elected Māori ward councillors on the governing body using the formula in legislation for electing members of parliament, Māori elected members of parliament, and the term we have coined there is the parliamentary model. A consistent message through all of this time has also been that the cap on the number of councillors on Auckland Council needed to be removed. The omnibus bill being promoted by Minister Mahuta is highly likely to achieve that, so you can put in place Māori seats in time for the 2025 election. At your meeting um, last year, December, the, you received recommendations from a joint group made up of councillors and independent Māori statutory board members in favour of the model of representation proposed by the Royal Commission for Auckland Governance in 2009, otherwise known as the Royal Commission model. At that meeting, you agreed to engage with Māori prior to determining your position on Māori representation into the future and resolved that the timeline for further, further work was reported back. This report outlines the proposed timeline. The engagement with Māori will include seeking their feedback on the models already identified, including the Royal Commission model. And some local boards have separately raised the opportunity for Māori representation on local boards. It would be useful to obtain feedback from Māori on this topic also. The focus of the engagement is with mana whenua and mātāwaka for that, and for that to occur from April through to June this year. Um, and in terms of wider public consultations, staff expect that the pending omnibus bill will provide requirements for public consultation, but we don't know what those are yet, so it's a little bit of wait and see. But we plan to bring the views of mana whenua and mātāwaka back to you in August, 
And this is an important issue for Tamaki Makaurau. So as Mayor Phil says, believe this would be a decision for a new council to make in December of this year. Um, that's it from me, Mayor Phil. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we've got the motion on the books. Um, I'm just wondering if Councillor Alf Filipina would like to move and Councillor Angela Dalton to second the, the recommendations. Happy to second. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Dalton. Alf? Chair, if, if, if uh, Councillor Henderson, well, if Councillor uh, Dalton will um, move and um, if I get somebody else to second, that'll be great. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm happy second. to second, Mayor. Oh, happy to second. Oh. Okay, I, there's uh, three of us jumped in there, so I'm going to move by Councillor Dalton, seconded by uh, by myself, uh, and we'll <laughs> now open this up. Um, that's the chair's prerogative. Um, open this up for any questions. It's I think it's pretty straightforward actually. Um, so if you have a question, can you please uh, indicate either in the sidebar or um, question, please. Yep, uh, question, we... Councillor Simpson. Thank you, Your Worship. Do we know how much this is going to cost? The consultation with Mana Whenua and Mapawaka is already within existing budgets, Councillor Simpson. Thank you. Thank you. Any further uh, questions? I have got some coming up now. Councillor John Watson. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks, Mr Mayor. Um, just uh, going to the, the sections to do with engagement and public consultation that was referenced at point 21, um, I see the, the extensive engagement with uh, mana whenua. As far as the, the general public goes, um, is there any intention from council um, outside of the public participating in the omnibus bill to, um, to engage or to consult on the collective suite um, of proposals that, that go to Maori representation. So I see in this instance some of the local boards have raised the, the opportunity of Maori representation on local boards. We have the, um, the the proposal to do with ward representation and of course we have the existing uh, representation of um, the IMSB which is nine individuals, uh, two of whom appear on every committee uh, except the, the governing body. So together, um, there's a lot more than just um, what's proposed in respect of the wards. So is there any intention from council to, to consult, to inform, to put the collective representation before the public for, for both information and for feedback? Through the chair, if I may, um, there is an opportunity to do that broader public consultation um, concurrently with the annual plan um, in the next financial year should a new incoming council decide that's the right thing to do and that would probably be pending the advice that we've had from Mana Whenua and Matawaka. Okay, so so just following up on that, so What's been suggested there is that uh, that that would be the call of the of the new council coming in, um, and that would be a an appropriate time to go out with the whole representative package as, as it would um, as it would be um, essentially up for decision making at that point. Through the chair, if you so desire, that's what we would put in front of you the options for that. We would note that we're not quite sure what the provisions are going to be in the omnibus bill. There might be some requirements um, to consult. Um, but we just have no way of knowing that yet. We haven't seen uh, we haven't seen what's coming in the bill. I, I think if you're changing a representation on council, uh, councillor, then uh, with or without the requirement under the legislation, uh, it would be wise to consult on any changes, as we normally do on any changes in representation uh, on council. That's uh, that's my personal view. Um, councillor Wayne Walker, next question. Uh, sure. So I've got a, a question around the um, consultation that's proposed with um, um, with um, Mata Waka and 
mana whenua. And that is, will that, um, uh, will that engagement be informed around the issues that Councillor Watson is raising? That is around Maori representation on um, local boards and also the IMSB. And the context around that is, of course, that the Royal Commission did not recommend the IMSB. Uh, that was the, the then national government that uh, brought that in. Um, so what information is being provided to um, uh, Matawaka and, um, and Mana Whenua? Specifically through, through the chair, specifically with respect to the IMSB? Um, with respect to the issues that Councillor Watson raised about Māori representation on local boards and also around the um, IMSB. Um, so what options are being um, uh, formulated for their consideration? Through the Chair, thank you for your clarification, Councillor Walker. The issue of the IMSB is out of scope. Um, of course, that may come up in the in the in the course of our um, discussions, our corridor, but it's not staff's intention to raise that issue. It's out of scope. What is our intention to raise is um, we will also be talking about the broader work for the future for local government and the questions that they have raised and the areas of inquiry. So in Māori themselves are well aware of um, the water reforms and all of the other things that are in the broader canvas of representation and the existing co-governance models that we already have. So no doubt those topics will come up in our discussion. Um, we'll be ready to answer those questions and put forward your current known views on those matters and um, then seek their advice on what they would like to talk to us about and do our best to answer questions. Um, but our intention is to is to go out with the issue of, around Māori representation, the parliamentary model, the Royal Commission model, and listen to their um, feedback about what they think about those models. That's the that's the core purpose of our um, engagement for this, but as I said, also combining it with the future for local government questions. Okay, so um, supplementary question. Um, given that the Royal Commission model did not include the IMSB, how can it be that IMSB and and even even Maori representation on local boards is out of scope? I, I I really don't understand that. Can you? I mean, have you had some legal advice on that? Uh, what informs the position that it's out of scope? And through the chair, this is a political discussion, and we believe. Um, that, that issue can be addressed at a later point in time if the feedback from Mana Whenua and Mata Waka directs us to look at that or advises that you look at look at that as a governing body. But right now we believe the key issue is on whether what kind of representation and how that representation should be achieved um, on governing body and on and potentially on local boards. We do not believe we have a man mandate to to speak to the issue of the IMSB. Um, through you, um, my my question, if I repeat it, is how have we arrived at the IMSB representation on local boards being out of scope? What advice have we had to tell us that those considerations are out of scope? Or if we have not had advice, then uh, then fine. Um, I'd just like to know. I, I think if something's out of scope, I'm assuming there's been some kind of information and decision making around that. Well, maybe, maybe I could help um, by suggesting an answer to that, Councillor. Um, at the moment, we have a policy that, um, and I think it was passed overwhelmingly, that we believe there should be direct Maori representation uh, on the governing body. Um, we have a policy that that should only happen once the omnibus bill has gone through and it enables us to do that. Uh, a discussion then arose with the IMSB where they said, we want you to look at the Royal Commission model. Uh, and 
we agreed that we'd, uh, we, we would consult on, on both models, but our current position is simply that we would adopt the parliamentary model of Māori representation. With regard to the IMSB, um, that is not a decision that we are empowered to take. The IMSB, as you rightly pointed out, uh, was created by a government statute and it can only be altered or removed by government statute. Now, at some point, if there is direct representation, the question of what the future role of the IMSB uh, should be uh, does become relevant. And we would need, or the, the council in the future would need uh, to consider what submissions it would make to government in terms of the government altering what the statute currently applies in terms of the dual role of uh, IMSB uh, of both representation on committees below the governing body level uh, and as an audit function. Now, that's not a that's not a decision that we can look at making now. Uh, our, our first question and what we're really consulting on on this is we have two different models, um, uh, one which is uh, the, the parliamentary model, the other, which is the Royal Commission model. Let's hear what, what both Mana Whenua and Mata Waka uh, say about that. We will listen to what is being said, or the council in the future will listen to what's being said. Um, it, it will make a, a decision as to what the governing body believes is the appropriate model to put out for consultation. We'll consult on it, and then we'll make a decision all prior to the 2025 election. But uh, I, I don't think we can start bringing in what the government should alter by way of its legislation until we've decided which model we prefer. Um, is that helpful in answering your question? Um, sure. So does it follow then that the feedback and the engagement that we're seeking from Mana Whenua and Mata Waka is expressly not going to be seeking any feedback on representation on local boards because that wasn't in the statute or on the IMSB because you're saying that um, that you know that was a government decision. They, they can, of course, pass opinion on that. Uh, that's entirely up to them as to what they want to do. But we're, we're, we're going out, correct me if I'm wrong, please, Rose. Uh, we're going out to say, these, these, are, these are two models. We'd like your feedback. And by the way, I mean, they can make, they can give us feedback on any aspect of the representation. But we as a council at the moment do not have a position on whether there should be Maori uh, 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 positions for local boards. And we don't have a position on the IMSB. Those will be positions that the governing body will consider for the future um, and uh, but that's not what we're specifically going out to talk about that's not what uh, our we've mandated our officials to do we've mandated our officials to go out and talk at two different models uh, and there, if you know whatever uh, the feedback is at some point the governing body will need to say okay um, are we going to go beyond uh, what we're proposing is a parliamentary model. If so, uh, what are we going to propose and uh, what are our suggestions going to be to the government uh, by way of those other issues? But that's not, that's we have not mandated our officials to go out and raise those points at this point because we don't have a position on it ourselves yet. Rosa, um, does that summarise your position? Yes, it does. Thank you, Mia Phil. Thanks, Councillor. Um, uh, I've got a Point of clarification for Councillor Alf Filipina. Alf, uh, if you'd like to take the call. Thank you, Your Worship. Look, I, I just wanted to clarify that um, the Royal Commission model was that from the joint working group that we put through, and then it had to go through. It wasn't from the IMSB themselves. Uh, it, it was a recommendation from the joint working group, and then it went back to our own entities to decide whether we supported that recommendation. That's all the point of clarification. It didn't come from the IMSB, Your Worship, that's all. Yep. No, no, that's true. Uh, there was a recommendation made by the joint working group consisting uh, of councillors and the IMSB. Uh, that recommendation was altered at the joint meeting of the IMSB with the governing body uh, that we should consider the two models, uh, and that's what we're working on. Uh, yep. Yeah, no, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for that. OK, if there are no further questions, are there any comments? If there are no comments, uh, I will then 
put the uh, the recommendations, which is agree to the timeline and note that feedback from Mana Whenua and Mata Waka will come to the August meeting of the governing body. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. 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 So, okay, would you like uh, the three councillors, would you like your um, your opposition and to the motion recorded? No. And mine as well, thank you. Okay, so uh, Councillor Sharon Stewart, uh, what other councillors would like it recorded? Wayne Walker. Councillor Walker. Watson. And Councillor Watson. Simpson, okay. one, uh, 11A, please. Sorry, uh, on? A, please. On A, okay. No, uh, okay, well, I might as well put my name as noted as against as well then. Thank you. Okay. Right, so we've got, uh, I think, five councillors recorded as opposing um, the timeline. Okay, um, right, uh, we'll move on now. The next item on the agenda is a summary of uh, governing body information, memoranda, workshops and briefings, uh, including the forward work program. Can I have a councillor to move that? I'll move, Cathy. Moved by Councillor Casey, Casey and by Councillor Collins, is it? Uh, I'm, yeah, OK. I was looking at the screen. I think I heard the Deputy Mayor in there as well. So I'll put the motion uh, that we note progress on the forward work programme. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Uh, declare that carried. Uh, there is no extraordinary business. So at this point, um, can I thank uh, councillors uh, for uh, their participation in the, uh, uh, the governing body today and to formally declare the meeting closed. Uh, enjoy the rest of the week. Kakite Anno. Thanks, Phil. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.